Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Sustainable Design of Learning Environments. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the Educational Facilities Discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Mr. Gunnar Hubbard. Mr. Hubbard has been involved in green building efforts for over 20 years. He is a licensed architect, a member of AIA, a LEED accredited professional, and a LEED faculty. He is currently consulting on projects throughout the United States, Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Furthermore, he teaches green building workshops around the world and is a founding member of the Maine USGBC chapter. Again, it is my honor to present to you Mr. Gunnar Hubbard, Thank you, Mr. Hubbard, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Thank you, Dr. Doris, for the introduction. It's great to be part of this program and to be here speaking with you today. I'm going to speak with you for the next 30 minutes on sustainable design and learning environments through the eyes of a green building consultant. I should note that as a licensed architect, I've chosen this path as a consultant so I might have a greater impact on improving our built environment. I may see the ability to work on more projects and more variety and therefore affect more change. Today I will cover descriptions of our role typically on projects, but certainly focus on school projects where we've been quite involved. I'm going to do a little bit of a broad brush on some of the statistics that exist on why green schools are so important, talk about these case studies, then provide an overview of what we call integrated design and how this process is what we see as a necessary tool in creating these great teaching environments. So just briefly, as green building consultants, our role then is to guide a project towards, well, the greatest success, right, in in terms of buildings. Many times we're brought in as a lead consultant where we manage the green building certification process. So lead is L-E-E-D. Our our ideal role, though, is as a project manager where we're really the ones who infuse a project with the green building potential. And that's through design process, uh, the construction process, and on into operations, too. That's the ideal role. And so in some ways, admittedly, it's like herding cats because this is so new to some clients and design teams. So the idea of trying to coordinate all these different players on the project is what we're trying to do toward a common goal and essentially high-performance goal. We want to really, I want to stress how important it is to really focus on, on the efforts as a team. And, and so as a consultant, we really need to do that. So if we're going to create a new school or a new classroom wing um, or, you know, a project in general, we want to get in as early as possible and manage that process about how we create energy efficiency opportunities, great air quality, high performance water systems, uh, whatever it is, and really, really sort of just work toward good use of materials and, and in general just being smart about how we put it all together. So many times this is a workshop with the architects and engineers. It's training the contractors. Sometimes it's getting in early with the owner even before they bring on the design team. And it's also during certain uh, climate analysis, energy modeling, daylight modeling, and whatnot. And that, that's really the bulk of what we do here at our firm uh, up in Portland, Maine, in the Northeast. The reality is that 55 million students, 5 million faculty, all make up about 20% of America's population. With that, and this was some statistics of recent years, about 35 billion tax dollars will be spent, in this case it's just K-12, through so it's a huge sector of our economy. And what we are finding in our work and then in the collaborative work with others in the green building world, and I must say that a bunch of these statistics come through the organization called the U.S. Green Building Council, that there's some great data coming through about green buildings in general and then also specifically about schools. And through the ability of organizing a team correctly, asking the right questions, 
educating a team about what's possible that we are able pretty easily without spending huge amounts of dollars more for bricks and mortar um, we're able to achieve and target 30 to 50 percent energy savings on a building carbon emissions 35 percent reduction water use reductions 40 percent or better and then diverting uh, solid waste from the landfill as a result of good practices with a contractor or 70 percent diversion from a landfill that is really really good statistics and it's being repeated time and time again with the statistics about schools you know the the more that we can be doing to really look at the taxpayer dollars and the importance of focusing on energy and water costs and creating these schools that are really wonderful learning environments that help increase student health in schools basically reduce their absenteeism make sure they're not uh, any of their asthma or flu symptoms are coming because of school through, let's say, mildew or poor air quality, and then creating these work environments and teaching environments that you know are filled with natural light and, and the fresh air. Those combined mean that kids are able to actually see what's on their desk, be it they're not distracted by noises in the classroom through poor quality air systems, and they can hear what the teacher's saying and what's happening is there's, there's with our standardized testing, showing that test scores are increasing as a result for students in green schools. And it's really a great story. And, of course, that links with teacher retention. It adds to a viability of a community when these schools are seen as something that they want their kids to go to because of what they've heard. And it sort of increases. I think you can track it to the... Taxpayer dollars, the value of property in a region through a really good school because it's um, it's critical. Um, I know myself, my wife and I chose the town we live in because it had a great school, and that's really important. So if we can add good teachers and a great school, it, it really means something. So I, I can't say enough about that. So obviously then... When we come on board and we start looking at a school project and we're hired as a consultant to work on them, you know, we're trying to look at what are the finances, what are the dollars there that are available, and are they being allocated right, and what can we do with this this information? And what I'm referring to here is this idea that many times we focus so much on the construction costs of a school or any building, really, that we a lot of times forget about the operating costs. And the operating costs affect the long-term life of the building and the taxpayer dollars. So the more that we can be thoughtful up front about savings makes sense. And so if you increase the financial performance of a building and energy performance, water saving, etc., 20 times, 30 times better than what would have done if we just followed what was uh, you know legally allowed, which is code. Um, we sometimes think we build building to code is such a great thing. We've done it, uh, but the reality is building to code is the worst legal thing that we can do without being thrown into jail as professionals. So if we use a statistic here about you know using that twenty percent, thirty percent increase performance let's say it translates to $100,000 a year. Now we're looking, obviously, at a fairly large school um, to come up with uh, savings like that. But that equates to teacher salaries, more teachers. It translates to more computers on the desk. It translates to more textbooks for the students. And so literally, if you go back to that statistic I had earlier about the billions of dollars that are out there, we can easily save through this effort, if we do a coordinated effort, $20 billion over the next 10 years, and that creates a lot of green jobs and a lot of great education. So there's a lot more to this than how it's done or a couple of case studies here that I'm going to talk about. So it's exciting, and I just want to sort of just make a plug here for the Center for Green Schools and for the U.S. Green Building Council that that's a resource, and there are many others out there, but that's a great one to look at and to learn from on the web. I'd like to move now to a project, that, and a couple of projects actually. I'm going to start with one 
that we did at the Wayne Fleet School here in Portland, Maine, which is where, where my firm is located. And this was a school that, that uh, they were doing a new auditorium for performances as a school that's very passionate about the arts. And they were doing a performance hall. And all of us have been in big auditoriums at schools. And what happens? Well, many times that building, that, um, that space, is left vacant until there's an event or a class or a lecture or something or an all-school gathering. It's you know pretty typical then to have an engineer design systems for it that would mean that it would you know be able to be shut down uh, when and only operate at the minimum ventilation rates until a lot of people come in. Well, if you're not thinking about embracing green building principles at this level here, you actually might miss out on some opportunities, and that's what was starting to happen on this project until we started doing some math. We did some energy analysis of this space, um, basically showing, you know, think of like a box space that has a stage at the end with, you need, uh, you know, enough volume there with a slope seating to get good views. Um, so it's, you know, pretty nice performance hall in the end. The first instinct of the engineer was to look at it, you know, in, obviously in the interest of saving money, to blow the air from above down and do an overhead air delivery system. And we said, well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, or, you know, here's a way that might make sense. What if we were to flip that around and actually deliver air down low? And I bet some of you have probably been in auditoriums where the air is delivered below the seat, but it's not done in every auditorium. But it's basically the air delivering below the seat. And what happens then is an auditorium fills up with people, and therefore just through body temperature and turning on the lights and having activity in a room, there's an internal temperature that starts rising. And in this case, you deliver cool temperature under the seats, and with the hot air rising, it go, rises up and out. And really all you care about is about a seven-foot bandwidth um, above the seats for comfort. If you were to be delivering air from way up high, you would be trying to provide comfort for the whole space pretty much and trying to blow cool air by that hot air rising so with this process of being able to deliver air low and, and use the fact that hot air rises when people get in this space that we could uh, downsize our cooling system and therefore pay less upfront money for a chiller and in the operations of it we wouldn't we didn't have to cool the air down as much because it was just coming in at a comfort level and then rising with the hot air rising it was Really, you know, in some ways straightforward, but it had to take a little reworking of the space and the organization and how the air was brought there from the machine room. But we were able to show the dollars and the dollars saved. And I think it did cost a little bit more, certainly for installation, but the payback was right there. And it's a great, great now auditorium for the Wayne Fleet School. Moving on to another school building that we did, it was at the Tabor Academy in Marion, Massachusetts, and here was a lab building. And it was the, you know, the one of the greenest things you can do is obviously, you know, not build another building at all, or if you're going to do it, retrofit an existing building. And then if you can't do all that, um, then you're building a new building. But in this case, there was an existing building that had some good bones, how we speak. It had enough quality within it that it didn't make sense to tear it down but it needed to be updated with systems just for the math and science and really was adding a lot of uh, hoods for just high school science, chemistry, etc. And that, those buildings, if you've ever looked at those, they actually use a lot of energy. So a lot of questions that we started asking with that one had to do with, uh, well, what kind of experiments actually are going to be done and how progressive is Tabor Academy going to be? Are they going to use all the toxic chemicals from here forward? Or is there an interest to sort of back off on some of those and do only the key ones necessary? So asking that question, what this means is asking the question, question about use, hours of use of big equipment that uses lots of energy and sucks a lot of air through a building because you'd only want to turn that on when you need to and otherwise try and operate the building at a at a more targeted level. And so we worked with the engineer and the 
teachers in this case and the design team to arrive at this and, and right size the equipment. We brought in as much daylight as we could uh, given some existing structure and roof configuration. There was maybe only so much we could do with some high efficient lighting that actually when the daylight is coming into those spaces we could turn the electric lights off and it's still a great teaching environment. That was so, so critical for this and and I would say it's critical for any school and classroom that we work on. It's all about natural light and lighting controls that can dim down and respond to that. So that was kind of the big moves of this this school was about efficiency in the systems and related to a lab building and big hoods that suck a lot of air and thinking about when those really need to be used. And we actually end up clustering those uh, between a couple of classrooms so that it could be much more focused in its work. And then the, the daylight and controls. This was a lead project, so we also made sure we didn't bring any bad materials into the building in the first place. We were thoughtful about the flooring that was brought in. Um, and in general, it was all about air, air and energy efficiency. One added piece of that, some of you may or may not know what commissioning is, and I don't have enough time in this talk to really go through it, but commissioning in brief is the idea that ensuring that what you've installed, uh, mechanical and electrical equipment, is performing as you intended. And it's this added effort of someone kind of falling behind the mechanical and electrical subcontractors to support them and make sure everything that's turning is going in the right direction. Well, in this case, the uh, facilities man at the academy wasn't sure that was needed. But in the end, you know, it was a lead requirement, and there was a little bit of that naysaying. Well, in the end, uh, the commission agent found all these things that would have not been found um, for, you know, months. They probably would have been found at some point, but in that first uh, operations, they were able to, the commission agent was able to find all these errors that just things were not quite tuned right. There were a couple of things that came from the factory that were wrong. And anyway, it's a, it's a story unto itself, but really, really exciting way of, of just showing that, that this idea of even though a facilities guy may have been around buildings for a long time, come bringing in a new building, starting it up, getting it going right does take some skill and some focus attention of a of the right professionals. So I, I think that's important to recognize. Jumping scales a little bit, uh, we're working on a lab building at the University of Massachusetts, the Sherman Center. And the story I want to tell about this one, again, big lab building, big energy. But we were fortunate enough to come in early enough with the design team. Well, I can't say we're always in this early, but we were in early enough while they were doing some initial massing of the building, giving that a half million square feet, how it could sort of coordinate the, the orientation and really would it make a difference or not since there's so much of an internal load on this building. When we started working with the architect and the engineers and looking at the massing, it actually did play a big role by getting the long face to the south, putting the classrooms and the sort of the non-lab spaces along that south side, and then giving proper overhang or orientation, shading devices, uh, disc control devices to keep that sun out, allowed actually for us to do some, you know, some rough energy models that showed basically on the utility data the university was using and what was projected for loading on this building, we were able to arrive at a you know savings just through, purely by orientation. And that obviously is going to affect the long-term performance of that building. There are a bunch more stories with that one, but I just want to make the plug about layout and organization of a school of learning environments, teaching environments, even if it's, you know, in this case, I had some offices mixed in with teaching environments. Orientation to the south can does make a difference, absolutely. When you get the orientation wrong, you end up overheating spaces, uh, like when that western facade, let's say, is to the sun, you end up having huge problems. And obviously not every project can we rotate around. If we're given a specific site, we have to respond accordingly, but uh, that's just a plug for orientation. So what these few little stories that I've told here about these learning environments the piece that I want to move to now is about this uh, idea about integrated design. 
it's it's something that you think uh, of course you know design teams work together and that's how you get a building built but the reality is too more often than not architects are hired and engineers are hired and and i've seen it happen so many times where the architect says we're just working on space organization we're just looking at relationships of classroom to uh hallway to play areas and then you know we'll bring you in for greening that later and sure enough the building ends up getting designed without all the uh thoughtfulness about climate responsive design sustainable practices and whatnot and so there's this whole effort with integrated design that you really want to work collectively as a team so sort of front load the design process a bit more than the traditional way so that you can work towards spending more money on the windows and better lighting and better insulation and some shading devices and controls and then by spending more money on those it allows you to downsize or what like like we like to say right size our cooling systems and our heating systems and literally those end up paying for those added costs when done right and you know it obviously it's every project is unique and some sites are better than others and some opportunities are better than others but um it's this idea that you work together to really collectively find the right solutions and something that where you're doing the math you you're adding value you're doing engineering along the way and what you really try and do then by doing that engineering where you're adding value along the way and tracking it is that you you know you're testing these different design cases through a, a team approach and running energy models is is the ideal way to really drive those energy reductions down and find those opportunities literally in some in our nor even our northern climates if a really good envelope for example can almost literally eliminate your perimeter heating you know that's pretty amazing but it's it's really creates comfort therefore you can have teaching environments right up to the windows cuz in the winter time people aren't cold etc anyway it's all it's all a coordinated effort but it's integrated design and for some of you that haven't maybe heard this before uh, what exactly that is there's some great resources on the good old internet to seek out for but it, it's it's a sort of a restructuring of the design process so to speak and it's um worthy of studying and and seeing how it might work to you or if you're um maybe the person uh, in the seat about to hire a design team ask them to describe their design process to you and that's what i think is is really important one other i thought fun project that might be a way to uh head towards closing up this this half hour that i've had with you is a project we recently completed up in again back up in maine and it was the coastal maine botanical gardens it's their new education center and so it was basically a classroom environment but what happened with this and this is plea to the decision makers hiring the design teams that we were fortunate enough to be hired before the design team and we educated in this case it was a non-profit board and a staff and we basically organized these and and facilitated these workshops on describing what is sustainable design what is possible with really coordinated effort and what was arrived at was this potential and reality for a lead platinum building and a building that was also targeting net zero energy and what that means on an annual basis we would be the building would produce more energy than it used on an annual basis so obviously some days it's using a lot of energy then other days when it's not so busy is producing more so talk about a need for integrated design and for working together this was really important to get the siting right of the building looking at the sun exposure getting the the um overhangs right we arrived at walls that were r40 roofs that were r60 literally fully daylit building uh, 90% plus of the spaces are daylit and uh, you know allowability for separating spaces uh, for teaching in three different zones or one big hall and and the 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 added i think piece of this was was uh, making sure then that the design team that was hired understood what this meant and so there wasn't a learning curve about how do you do integrated design so that was really important that they put the right team together they brought the engineer 
to the table with them and described how they were going to work together, how they were going to right size, you know, so that right size equipment and really, you know, basically do the number crunching. If you're trying to get to a lead platinum building, a net zero energy building, you really, really need to um, arrive at the right math and do that collectively and then select the right equipment to go with it, get the right contractor on board, all those great things. So it's it's a really good uh, example that I urge you to, to uh, certainly go on Google and look at that. The Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens and it's their new Basarge Family Education Center. It's a great little example. The piece there that I think we were have been finding with these case studies I just mentioned, and maybe more in particular uh, with this final uh, coastal main project, was the idea of using the building as a teaching tool. And what the client was very excited about that because they have over 100,000 people coming through this center um, just to look at the gardens, and they're uh, basically constant programs now in this. So it was a great teaching environment. But it, this is done on more and more green schools, and I just happen to have this one as the most current one. But using, um, in this case, we actually used a, an education, a display panel, touchscreen panel, that showed like you know, kind of like the Prius effect, how much energy was being used for electrical use and water heating, and um, how much were the photovoltaics generating electricity on that day or that hour, and then there were signs around the whole building, so you can do a self-guided tour about the materials uh, that were used and the air quality and the ventilation, the systems, just really, really fun. And, and in this case, we actually made it web-based, so it links to the website of the botanical gardens. But we did this also on a school, the East End School in Portland, Maine. We've done this on so many projects using this opportunity the public's coming through and they use it for teaching though as well like certainly the parents the teachers but then the students and the probably one that i like doing was um we had three different wings on this school the east end school that that it was just we allowed the students actually in the curriculum to compete in the three different wings who's going to use less energy because there's a meter on it so if you don't have a me- measurement is what is critical right it says you can't manage what you can't measure. In this case, you can't teach about measuring if you don't have a um, a little speedometer on it, so to speak. So I, I would urge that as in closing here that um, use buildings as a teaching tool. Use these schools as teaching tools and really integrate curriculum, uh, science, and math and 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 spend that little extra money maybe on some on things that go were uh, to track it and and see what's possible but i really see so much potential our schools where our kids learn be it k through 12 or 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 and beyond it's so so important that we are thinking about these teaching environments and creating using them as examples for what a good space should be and providing them the best learning opportunity as possible supporting our teachers and and seeing that through. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to to speak and share a little bit about our experience and about sustainable design. And uh, ultimately, you know, I wish you all well in embracing this idea of creating high-performance schools and learning environments that are conscious of the, yes, the bricks and mortar costs, but the long-term energy efficiency, performance. You know, what if we could create buildings that produce more than they use, clean the air, clean the water, and what if our schools across America were the leaders of this movement and changing the way we do things? Again, my name is Gunnar Hubbard. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening to our podcast today, Sustainable Design of Learning Environments. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn more from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge regarding sustainable design of learning environments. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Gunnar Hubbard, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation at acefacilities.org. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.